And it's not just macro photography that we're talking about. We're talking about getting up close, because uh, there's actually other ways to get up close to things other than macro. So I included a little bit of everything here. Um, so yes, uh, here we are, pre presentation number two. And uh, this one is, I called it getting up close and personal because it really is about that more than just macro or the technicalities. It's about getting up close and having more interesting photos. So um, this one is sponsored by PowerX. And um, just like in the last presentation, I want to thank them because literally without them, I don't fly out here. Uh, so they, they really cover the cost of, of, of that. So uh, thank PowerX for sponsoring. If you're not familiar with them, they make all of the batteries I use and the chargers I use. I'll show you some of them in the presentation. Um, I've been using their, their batteries exclusively for quite a while in all my flashes. And then I realized that they not only make double A's, but they make triple A's, D cells, C cells. So now my whole house is running on PowerX. My, head, my headphones, I use my noise canceling headphones for the flight over here. More PowerX batteries in there as well. So great product. And we'll talk about this a little bit later as we go through. But first of all, let's start with why is closer better? And um, what I love about shooting close, macro, is that you see the unseen. And you know, if you look back at the presentation I did this earlier today, I talked about social media and the immediacy and how fast we're all moving. You know, I mean, you can't even go to Disneyland anymore and wait in line without seeing everybody with their phones out. Like, we become this, this society that has an attention span that's, that's very short, um, and we miss a lot. I mean, even myself included. So I like the fact that, that when you get up close, you see things or we're showing things to our viewers that they're not normally seeing. Um, and so people need to take the time to find the stuff. Um, and what's, as I say in the last bullet point, it can be done anywhere. If you even go to your front yard and your back backyard, you'll find really, really cool things that you probably didn't notice before. I learned a long time ago, uh, snorkeling at the Great Barrier Reef, I did this little class called Reef Teach, and they said the best way to snorkel, you're not there to get exercise. You're there to snorkel. The best way to snorkel is actually to get to a really cool area and just float and stop and just stay there and look because things will come out because you, you'll be there for a while and they won't be scared and you'll see things you didn't see before. Whereas if you're barreling around in the water trying to find stuff, you're missing a lot. So sometimes just slowing down and taking that extra step, you'll see really cool stuff. Um, as Deborah said, uh, Robert Kappa said, if your pictures aren't good enough, you're not close enough. And there's a lot to be said for that. I get a lot of people who email me pictures and say, what, you know, especially sports, because I shoot for the Olympics and they go, hey, what about this one? And you know it's a stadium, and the uh, the athletes about this big in the distance. And I'm like, is that a? I can't tell. They're playing croquet, football, soccer. What they're doing? So you you want to be into the action. And I think the same thing is true here. Whether it's an animal or something else, getting close and getting into their face really makes a big difference. So. With that said, um, I talked about the fact that it could be done anywhere. These are some of the first macro shots I ever took. I took these probably 10 years ago. Um, I included these because it's taken like with a Canon 30D and a, an off-brand macro lens, still took a nice shot. So it doesn't mean you have to have the best cameras for everything um, to take a decent macro shot. This is in my backyard. So the other one's in my front yard, this one was in the backyard. My wife spotted this little guy hanging out one of our plants, just grabbed the camera and the tripod, set up and shot it. But how do we get closer? And that's my daughter when she was little, she's now 20. Um, but you know, it's a picture I put in there because she was so close and she was so little. That's the other thing. When kids, you know, they're, they're short, right? And they look at things and from a totally different perspective than we do. Not to mention the fact that they don't have the social blinders on. As we get older and we get taught the way we're supposed to shoot, you got to shoot straight. You have to do this. And we look at things differently. And there's something about the innocence of kids where we came back from this particular shoot and she'd got all kinds of photos that I didn't get. I went back and reshot a couple and stole her shots because I liked them. But she was in close, which I liked. So one way to get in close is without a macro lens, without a long zoom lens, right? just move in close. I see this a lot with people with their mobile phone where they're doing it, you know, I'll be at an event and, the, and they'll go to take a picture. And they're so far and the people are so small. I, like, and I always take my grandma and I take her and I move her. Keep going, keep going. Okay, now take the picture. Oh yeah, it's just getting closer. Human zoom, that's what I call moving with your feet. Long lenses. So it's not just macro, but a long lens can really make a difference as well. I'm gonna show you a couple of my favorites and what I did with them. And I promised 
that 99% of the people that are watching this both here and online have never seen this before, I'm teasing you, uh, but this is an adapter that most people have never heard of, but it lets you take really cool macro shots with just about any lens, so I'm gonna talk about that. And then of course we'll talk about macro lenses as well. So, kind of jump in. Long lenses, uh, I do love zooms. I'm partial to zooms because I love the ability to reframe either with or without moving and getting in close. I'm, I, I'm not a fan of like, I mean I love the 400 2.8 lens that Canon makes, great lens. I rarely ever use it because I like zooming. So my two favorite lenses uh, for zooming are the Canon 100 to 400 and the Canon 200 to 400. Um, for those not familiar with these lenses, uh, the one on the, uh, the 100 to 400 is a reasonable amount of money for probably, I think it's about $2,000, and this one's about $10,000, a big difference. Um, but with that said, the 100 to 400 is also a very transportable lens, which I love, because when I go down to Costa Rica, like we were last month, uh, and we'll be going back on a workshop in uh, November, if you want to sign up, it's on the website, uh, that's the lens I take, because the 200 400 is a great lens, but it's big, and it's, and it's uh, a, a lot to carry. Now, when I shoot the Olympics, I live on the 200 to 400 lens, and the advantage of that lens is it's got a built-in teleadapter, so I can flip a switch and it goes right to 560 millimeters, which is really cool. And the optics are amazing. It's a great, great lens, but it should be for 10 grand. Um, but those are my two favorites, and the, the, I don't own the 200 to 400. I only borrow that when I shoot the Olympics, although I may soon own one. Uh, but the 100 to 400 is the one I is my go-to lens for, for most of my zooming. This is a shot I took in, uh, a lot of the shots you'll see today are from uh, last month's trip to Costa Rica. Uh, we went into the rainforest, there's a, a resort there I'm, I'm working with, and it, there's no high-rise hotels. It's like the town is this tiny little town, there's no t-shirt shops, it's real. It's the real Costa Rica. And these are some of the guys that, that um, uh, one of our guides and some of the guys I was showing uh, and teaching, but everybody at their zoom lens is going, and um, it definitely helps for getting in close. So this is a shot I did, this actually is from a previous trip to Costa Rica, and this is a toucan, and this toucan was uh, actually in a, uh, not really a zoo, but in a captive environment. Well, I don't want to shoot this from really far away because you can see all the, the fences and everything else. So by the great thing, great thing about zooming is if you zoom in at the right angle and you're close to the fence, you don't even see the fence. So by zooming in really tight, this is using the older 100 to 400, I was able to get the shot. And again, by being really close, it lets you see the colors, it lets you see their eyes, and it's a much more interesting shot than what you would be taking, let's say, with a mobile phone, where you know people see a little thing about this big, and they, what is that? Oh, that's a toucan. <laughs> And, and I saw this, like I've seen this in Africa, and I've seen this in Costa Rica, and I've seen this in Europe, where you know, people go on these amazing safaris and things, and they take an iPad. Well, it's good if you want to show the scene, but it's not going to get you in close. This is a shot, another shot from Costa Rica. This is one of the white-headed monkeys. And this guy was kind of guarding his family. And, and so, you know, again, you know, there was all this wildlife there, and I wanted to zoom in, and I wanted you into the eyes of this guy as he kind of guarded the family. This one uh, was taken on my first trip to Tanzania. And this, uh, the, th these guys come out uh, to kind of scavenge and try to get in your vehicle at certain spots along the way. And when you when you go into the Serengeti, you have to stop and show paperwork that you're that you're that you've paid to go in. These guys know that, and they're there waiting for all the vehicles. The people don't know any better and leave a vehicle open, and they're in there grabbing all your food. So this guy was actually on concrete or on the pavement of the road. I don't want to show that. So by using the 100 and 400 and getting down really low at the same level as this guy and shooting right straight into the eyes, it now brings you into the soul of that animal. And this is at 400 millimeters right in. And again, I did it for two reasons. One, I wanted to get close. This is not a crop. And the other reason was I don't want you to see that he's on pavement. And it's not just animals. This is a shot I did at the Summer Olympics in London. And again, it's a different take on what most people would shoot. So most people, when they do photography, they're shooting the whole wide scene. So the case of water polo, you can have multiple uh, you know, athletes in the shot, and you'll see the whole pool. And I did a lot of shots like that, but then I saw the Olympic uh, logo 
tattooed on her arm, and I got lucky on this shot. But but coming in close, it tells a completely different story than if I had shot the wide shot of this or a different scene. This is one uh, from the last Olympics in Rio. It's last year. And um, again, I chose to shoot it this way. Some people look at this and say, oh, too bad that wasn't a photo because you can't see who it was. Well, I was at the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs, and uh, I saw how difficult it is to do this maneuver. To even, even get on this thing, let alone flip yourself around once, is really hard. It's all about the handwork. So I actually framed this to get the Rio logo and the hands and the dust from the, you know, from the powder in that shot. And I, and I did it because I'm trying to tell a different story than just the wide shot. So again, everybody thinks of macro or whatever for you getting up close, it's more than that. This shot, um, in Tanzania, uh, even the lizards look better than ours. Uh, and I love the colors. And this is actually taken uh, with a 200 to 400, which I used at the last uh, safari. And um, I, this is handheld. And I knew that these guys were uh, up on this one rock area, because I remembered from the year before. So I took everybody up to shoot pictures of these guys. And this is not altered. This is the real color. So again, coming in close to this and not having them on all the rocks or seeing three or four of them together, but coming in nice Nice and close brings you into their environment. As I mentioned, it's not just wildlife, it could just be flowers. This is coming in close, you know, on a huge bed of flowers, and again, everybody was taking the whole entirety of it. And I said, I don't care, I mean, I, I, I got a shot of all the flowers, but I really like the fact that I could just isolate this one red one that was amongst all the pink ones. So by coming in tight on that, again, totally different story and a different look. Same thing for this one, I was shooting a bar mitzvah uh, in, Cal in the Bay Area, in California where I'm from, and there was this tulip tree in full bloom, and it was a beautiful tree, but it was massive with all the tulip blooms. Well, I shot a wide shot of it, and I thought, ah, it just doesn't do it justice. It didn't really work. So again, I used the uh, long lens. I zoomed in just to this one area of one branch and shot it, and it's a very different look than the entire scene. All right, so I teased you earlier about the adapters, and um, this is one that uh, I, I've used many, but this is one that most people have never heard of. Has anybody here in this room heard of a 500D? A couple people, all right, I'm surprised. So this, I brought one with me. So Canon calls this a lens. I call it a filter. But basically, it is this device that goes, uh, kind of dirty. This goes on, uh, this is a 77 millimeter. So it'll go on my 100 to 400, it'll go on my 70 to 200, any other 77 millimeter lens, and it basically turns it into a macro, which is really cool. Now, there's a couple of advantages of having this, and why, one of the reasons I like this is if I'm going somewhere, if I'm going to Costa Rica, I tell people, you're bringing a macro lens, because you want to have one there. And actually, the cool thing about my uh, uh, working with, with Canon is anybody who goes on my workshops, we can get loaners for free from Canon. So um, to bring, you know, if you're going somewhere that's predominantly macro, or a lot of macro, bring a macro lens. But if you're going somewhere where you, you might want to shoot macro, but you don't want to carry a whole separate lens for it, I can just take this with me in my bag and it converts my other lenses into a macro. The other advantage of this one over things like extension tubes and all that is it goes on the front of the lens. So one of the challenges in shooting in uh, remote areas is all the dust that gets into your camera sensor. So I really li don't like changing lenses if I'm somewhere that's not really clean. So if I had to change a lens in this room, we'd be fine. There's not a lot of dust in here. Um, but if you're in the middle of the safari in Tanzania, especially in the dry season, changing a lens can be brutal. So by throwing this on the front is really handy. So I'm gonna show you, this is the first shot I ever took with this, uh, with the 500D. And this is in Hawaii, it was just a gecko on a leaf. This thing was literally like a couple inches big. It was a tiny, tiny little thing. And um, I thought I might give it a try. Now normally your focal distance on a 100 to 400 lens might be three feet. But with this on the front, I can actually come in this close to it and, and, and it focuses. So I was really close to my subject. And just for the fun of it, I did a couple shots. This is just two days ago in my front yard. This is not a macro. This is with a 100 to 400 just at a moth right in the front yard. And this is what it looked like on the front of my lens. So again, it just this particular one is a 77 millimeter, screws right on the front, and now everything is different. 
So where you look through your lens, if I were to try to take a picture of the people in the front row, it would not work. I'd have to get really, really close to them before it actually even focus. So to give you an idea of how that looks, this is in my backyard, again, two days ago, uh, with, the, with that on the front. This is a 100 to 400, focusing like, what, six inches above the flower. And so just by pointing like that, I was able to take a picture of the, with that lens just like that. And that's just taking this with me. So, so I do put this in my bag quite often. If I think there's a chance I might be doing some macro work or you want to get close, that's what I'll use. You can do extension tubes. Um, you can get a set of three for you know, maybe a hundred and some odd dollars. Um, they're not expensive. And um, they do actually allow you, especially with a macro lens, to, to focus closer. Um, as I mentioned, the disadvantage is that you've got to then take your lens off and put this in between. So it makes it a little more of a challenge. Um, so the, with an extension tube, normally this is a macro shot, again from Costa Rica, of, of a butterfly. And with the extension tube, you can actually move in closer and get shots that are much tighter. So if you want to shoot much closer than this, and you want to get in closer, you can add different tubes, or you actually put multiple extension tubes if you want, to actually allow yourself to, to focus even closer. Then there's macro lenses. Um, and, and honestly, for getting in close, there's nothing better um, for small objects than a macro lens. This is one I use, the, uh, that is not right, sorry guys, it's not the 100-400, that is just a standard 100 Canon 100 millimeter macro lens, my mistake. Um, and that's a lens that um, I use for all of my macro work now, not just for wildlife, but at weddings, shooting the rings, things like that. So this is uh, trip number one to Costa Rica, um, and I love the red-eyed uh, frogs because they just have that amazing look to them. Um, this is a shot I really wanted when I went down uh, to Costa Rica. This is the on the Caribbean side, they actually have the orange feet, and on the other side, they don't, which you'll see in a second. Um, this shot was taken with the 100 millimeter macro. Uh, I believe I had a 5D Mark III on that trip. And um, again, always focusing on the eyes. That's what I'm aiming for. Now, one of the challenges we'll talk about in a minute is, is aperture and depth of field with macro, but we'll get to that in a second. This is a shot from the trip last month. Same frog, notice the hands uh, the, the, are no longer orange, now they're green. Uh, this is on the other side of Costa Rica. But great look, and I love the uh, just the whole, again, these, for those of you who have not seen these frogs, they're literally this big. They're really small. What you, but what you see here and what you see here, they look much bigger. I envisioned that originally the frog was like that big. Didn't know that how small they were. So by bringing this into the frame and you're showing people details like the black spots on them. That's not mud. They actually have black markings on the frogs. And um, normally you would never see that. Actually, this shot is so tight that if I zoom into the eye, you can actually see me taking the photo of the frog. Um, this was, uh, again, another uh, shot from Costa Rica. And the butterflies there are amazing. They have some beautiful colors and things. And so we were uh, just out in this area with different plants and just photographing the, the butterflies up close. And the thing is, we, we forget, because we see one, and we don't look at the patterns on the wings and the colors as much as we should. Another one from Costa Rica. Um, di very different look. And one of the things I'm working on is to make sure that I get the, the head and the face in focus. No different than if I'm doing, taking a portrait. It's really usually about the eyes. And so I want to focus on that. This is in my front yard just to be, just hanging out. And you know, even a flower. So this is a flower in my backyard. Now, We'll look at flowers again in their entirety, and it's like, oh, that's really pretty. But we don't look at the details. How many people actually stop, look at the inside of a flower to see that? Most of us don't. So again, my goal when I'm taking that photo is, how, did I, how do I take you as a viewer into a different level? Um, this is a tiny little snake. This thing was probably only this long, uh, although you'd never know it from this shot. This is taken near Yosemite. It was a tiny little snake. I happen to have my macro with me, and I shot that one. It, but you'd never know from the photo. You might think the thing was like six feet long. So there's certain things that you want to do 
when you're shooting mac macro in certain settings. So aperture is critical, and we have to rethink and relearn aperture when you're shooting with a macro lens. So one of the mistakes that people make is they think that they're gonna shoot at f2.8 or f4. It doesn't work very well unless you're doing very, something very selective or creative, because typically what happens with a macro lens is your depth of field is exaggerated. So what you'll get is very small portion will be in focus and everything else is out of focus. I'm going to show you some examples of that in a minute. So you want to watch the aperture. Your foreground and background is just as important in macro or close-up photography as it is in any other photography. So you shot, we talked about the picture of the, of the baboon up close, so I don't want to see the background because the background didn't help it at all. Um, but in the case of the tree frog, I, I made sure that there was good greenery in the background you know, so that it would add to the color in that photo. So I'm literally moving an inch or two in certain directions to get that shot. So think about you know, and sometimes I'll shoot through a leaf so it adds some color in the foreground. So just small movements make a really big difference. Um, tripods are something that I, uh, I use a lot of the time because unlike other photography where you can get away with it handheld, it is harder with macro because the slightest motion when you're focusing can be either in focus or out of focus. So again, talking about the aperture, uh, shooting an image like this for a wedding, if I try to handhold it, it's hit and miss. If I literally move centimeters in or out, I'll be out of focus. And of course, the key for this shot is the diamond on her ring, because she matters, right, during a wedding, he doesn't. Um, just kidding. Um, but I need to get that diamond in focus, so literally the difference between moving in and out of you know, a fraction of an inch will be the difference. So a lot of times when I'm shooting these, I will put it on a tripod, and I will shoot it at apertures of like f11, f16, to make sure I get everything in focus. In this case, I definitely did that because I need the, the necklace, both rings, and I want the flowers all in focus. So that's going at like f16. Here, a little different. It's f11, getting both rings pretty much in focus and letting everything go out of focus after that. Now normally, if you were to shoot this type of photo with a zoom lens, you could shoot this at f4 and get those both in focus and have bokeh in the background, have that soft focus in the background. Not true with a macro. So. That exaggerated depth of field is something you want to think about when you're taking these photos because um, it, 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 will, it will literally make or break your shot. Okay, uh, it's not just movement. You might be still, you might be on a tripod, and if you have wind, it's going to throw off your shot. Again, if you're using a long lens and you're just, or if I'm doing a portrait and there's a little bit of wind, or you, you know, the person might be moving a little bit, you might be okay. But with a macro, literally any movement is going to be a problem. So uh, the picture you saw with the 100 to 400 uh, pointed right down to that white flower, and I showed you that shot. I had to wait. It took me about five minutes to get the shot because it was a windy day uh, where I live, and that thing kept the the flower kept blowing back and forth. So I had to wait for it to settle. Now the other advantage of macro, or disadvantage of macro, or challenge, is that you have to be close to your subject. So if you're photographing a poisonous snake, it's probably not a good idea. Um, so when we were in Costa Rica, we actually didn't see any, but we had a, a wrangler, actually, who had some, and he would put it out on a tree branch for us or whatever to shoot. I used the 100 to 400 on those shots, because I really didn't want to be that close, and he said, like, you don't want to be that close to that. On most of them. I'll show you one where I cheated. Okay, so here's a shot. Again, the last trip to Costa Rica, this is actually the last night we were there. This is a tree frog with his eyes closed. Uh, this was shot at 2.8. Why would I even think about shooting at 2.8? Well, it was dark. It was the middle of the night, and uh, all we had was flashlights. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Um, so I lit it, and I thought, I'll try to get it in focus, at, and, and I had very little shutter speed because it was so dark. So I shot at 2.8. The problem at 2.8 is his eyes in focus, but even the tip of his nose is out of focus, and the whole body's out of focus. To me, this is a non-shot. This is like a throwaway to me. The same night, we happened to see these two that were uh, having uh, a relationship, and um, <laughs> was that good? Uh, and I took this at four or five. Again, I'm trying to push the aperture to go a little narrower, um, 
but have shutter speed. But even at 4.5, you can tell that the heads are pretty much in focus, and as it trails off the back of their body, it's now out of focus, and that's at 4.5. This one's at f8. Again, look at the background, how out of focus it is. That, those, the, the leaves behind it aren't that far, maybe a foot or two away, but because we're using a macro, everything is exaggerated. Look at the, even F8, look at the front hand to the back hand. The back hand is completely out of focus. So as I'm shooting this, I'm trying to shoot this at F8 or F10 or F11 or whatever I can, still getting the background out of focus, because I don't want you looking at the leaves in the background. I want you to look right at the, at the tree frog or the, who's looking at us. And again, where's my focus right in the eyes? But if, that, if the flower is moving, or if the frog is moving, or if I'm moving, either of those three could be a non-shot. So this started handheld, and then I ended up setting up the, uh, the tripod. The good news is once they, they plop down they usually stay for us for a minute or two until we get our shot and then we give it the thumbs up and then it'll hop to the next spot. <laughs> we actually had a couple times where they would, they would take off and we'd be, we have to chase them back. And, and the cool thing is the guy, the, the snake wrangler guy, would, he caught them the night before. And we saw them in the wild as well. The other ones you saw were in the wild. And this guy, we had him actually place them for us. So one of the cool things about the trips I lead to Costa Rica is that we have a combination of shooting in the wild but also controlled areas where we can get shots like this. This was a poisonous snake. I did shoot this with a macro, um, and, and I shot this at f11, and one of the reasons was I wanted the head of the snake in focus, and I wanted more of the body in focus, and again, if I had shot this at 2.8 or f4, or even 5.6, the head might be in focus, but then you wouldn't be able to see enough of the body, and I wanted you to see that. Um, so again, as I'm taking these photos, I'm thinking about what the end result is. Um, and what you're going to see, and I'll try. I'll try this at different shots. I'll try this at at f5, 6. I'll try at f11. I'll try at f16. Um, if, in this case, if it's if it's staying still enough to allow me to do that, I'll do that. Okay. And then there's light. There's adding light or not. And so uh, I've talked about this in, in other presentations here. There's times when adding light really helps and there's times when it does not. Um, so I want to show you some of the shots where I've done that and not. So I will try to place myself where I can use ambient light to my advantage. Um, if possible, in those night shots, you didn't have any ambient lights, so you had to create your own. Yeah. So then I'll do it either with a flash or a ring flash or an attachment that goes on the flash that throws the, a red, the light around the lens. That's very good for macro. Um, or um, I'll add light with flashlights. So uh, I talked about PowerX and how they're sponsoring this. I use all their batteries and I bring extras in our flashlights so that we have flashlights to help light things. Because sometimes your flash won't get enough light where you want it to and you can actually have people hold flashlights and angle light different ways for you. So here's a shot I did, again, in my backyard. A lot of backyard shots here. Again, proving the point that you can shoot pretty things without going anywhere. Um, and this was a, one of the flowers that my wife had planted and it had yet to open. And what happened was I was in the backyard doing something and the sun was behind the flower and hitting it and lighting the tips of it and also the base, you see a little light coming. It was just coming through that and I thought, that's really cool. So went got the tripod of the macro lens, got down really low to the flower and shot straight across it, again using that sunlight to help create the image. 10 minutes later, when the sun was not hitting that flower, it wasn't a shot. So I'm using the ambient light to my advantage by having this backlit subject. Here's a shot I did um, in my mother-in-law's backyard. Uh, do you see a trend here? I bring my camera everywhere. Um, and this is a hummingbird. I did not add a flash to this. Um, and, but by adding a flash, again, another shot from Costa Rica, um, just like their frogs, even their birds are prettier. Um, but look at the color in the hummingbird. Now, if I had not added flash, you would not see that color. A lot of people, when they see me shooting daylight, and they wonder why I have a flash turned on, and I have, I have people ask me all the time, like, why are you doing that? Well, it exaggerates the colors. So, and it also helps you freeze your subject because you're adding more light to it. It'll freeze it in place. The, their wings are moving fast enough that you'll still get the motion. 
So just kind of talk about this for a second. When I shot this, I knew I wanted the motion in the wings. So I'll set my shutter speed at you know, 100th of a second or 150th of a second, because that will still show the motion. But I want the bird in focus. I did, uh, getting the tongue sticking out was a, was a bonus. That was not planned, it's kind of happened. But again, by adding that flash brings out the color. And a lot of people will say to me, why are you using a flash if you're shooting an animal or something that's 100 yards away? And I tell them, it will make a difference. And they don't believe me, it does. These things will, a good flash will reach that far and make a difference. In this case, I was probably about six feet from the bird. The hard thing, if anybody here has tried photographing hummingbirds, there's a lot of F-bombs that get dropped because it's so frustrating because they move so fast and you're, you're trying to get them and the minute you lock focus and you go to shoot, they're gone. Um, it, was a, it was quite the effort to get it, but worth it if you can get one good shot. This is a shot I did uh, on the last trip to Tanzania. Same thing, bird on a rock. I love the colors of these birds. It doesn't show up as much until you pop the flash on there. So I lit this uh, regular TTL, no plus or minus, just straight TTL on the camera and fire. This is that same night that we were shooting those other two frogs that you saw a different angle. And when I shot this, um, a couple things happened. We just finished dinner, I didn't have a flash with me. But I really wanted the shot, and so luckily my wife took this picture. This is kind of funny. This is what it looked like. Um, this is on the property where we stay at the resort. So my daughter is holding a flash, Brian's holding a flash, Bryce is holding a flash, this guy's got a flash. So everybody was lighting it for me. That's me with the 100 millimeter macro to get the two frogs that you see in that shot. So that became this. <laughs> Pretty funny. So these are the batteries. Um, so the, the PowerX batteries I use, these are the AA version. This is the bigger charger. The cool thing about this one is it charges AA's, C's, D's, uh, AAA, um, all of them from one charger. And I love the backlit screen. Uh, by the way, I should mention, um, also, that this, uh, the brand is PowerX, the company is Maha Energy. This charger and the other charger that I'll show you, this one here, both charge way, way faster than any charger I've ever used. Um, so I was using a previous company's charger and I would have to charge my batteries for like seven hours or overnight to get them fully charged. And then I, Sil Arena, who teaches sometimes here, great guy, I asked Sil, I go, what are you doing for batteries chargers because I hate my he turned me on to these guys. This will charge a full set in like an hour, and you can condition batteries where it'll drain them and charge them back up again. Great product, and literally this one uh, and this one, which I keep in the trunk of my car, so I was shooting the bar mitzvah this weekend, uh, and I was shooting a lot of stuff flashed because it was an outside bar mitzvah, so I was going through batteries a little faster than usual, so I was recharging as I was going. And so I was just throwing them in my little smaller charger here. You will notice, by the way, that my batteries all have labels on them. I always date my batteries when I first start using them. So I know which sets are older and need to be you know, uh, purged and then moved to the next set. So not only do I date them, but do you notice how they're lab they're, the labels are in different spots on the batteries? So these are all from 917. But this set and that set, I know they're different sets because of the way they're labeled. I always keep my sets of four together. So I bring them in and get rid of them, all the sets. And then they're going into flashes that way. So it's a, and like I said, the good thing is you can recondition them, but it really makes such a huge, huge difference. Um, okay, so uh, tours, photo tours coming up, um, and I still have the error, I didn't fix it, my bad. Um, New York, Costa Rica, we've got Japan coming up, Namibia, Botswana, Co Costa Rica again, Croatia, Slovenia, and Tanzania twice, and then uh, January, February, and then also for the migration coming up in uh, August of 2019. And um, for that, for those, you know, it's kind of interesting, I, like, I use the long lenses in Africa, but I don't bring a macro. I only take the macro to places like Costa Rica where I think I'm going to need it. Um, Japan, I probably would not take a macro there either. So, but long lenses, for most of the trips, I like to take typically a 16 to 35, 
a mid-range zoom, so 24 to 70 or 24 to 105, and a long lens. So I usually take the 100 to 400 because it's transportable enough. The 200 to 400 is just too big to take with me all everywhere. So that's kind of my go-to. And I have different kit, and I always recommend when we go on workshops, I'll tell people, here's the, the product, here's the lenses I recommend. For instance, in Africa, I took a 16 to 35. I barely used it. So I don't know if I'll take it on the next trip. Because for that one or two shots where I needed it, I could pr probably could have got away with a 24 and shot it. So, or you could do panoramas, and that would work as well. So we jammed through that pretty quick. Um, that's how you get a hold of me. I do answer every email. So um, if you want to email me at jcable at jeffcable.com, Facebook, Instagram, or both Jeff Cable Photography. Uh, my blog is just blog.jeffcable.com, and that's my website. And um, so you'll, you'll see a lot of the photography that you see here on the website. And the blog, I, I tend to do the same thing on the blog that we talked about today. So when I'm shooting, so on the blog right now is all the photos from Costa Rica. And I talk about how we shot them, why we shot them, um, and, and what lenses I used, and why I chose that lens. Because I think one of the challenges um, is if you're not doing this every day, you tend to get confused, like you know, what would be the best way to shoot this, or what angle? And I see a lot of times when people are shooting with a macro, they might be going from six feet tall. Well, the best shot might be to either get down or get underneath it and shoot underneath whatever it is, flower or what have you. So those are the things that we go through when we're out there. And when we're on workshops, you just never know what you're gonna get, which is part of the fun. So you can go to Costa Rica every three months and see something totally different. Same thing with Africa, and we've done it numerous times. Uh, it just changes so much day to day. All right, well, thanks. You guys all learned something, I hope? Yeah. yeah. Cool.